Good morning, Life Fellowship. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. I'm so glad to see you guys. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It always is good to meet with Him, isn't it? It's always good. Take your Bible with me this morning. Let's turn to two passages of Scripture. I'm going to make it real easy on you today. If you'll turn to Acts 1, Acts chapter 1, and then uh, find your place over in Acts 8. So we'll start in Acts 1, and then uh, eventually we'll read Acts 8. Let me just say uh, thank you this morning. If you brought your Bible, thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing your Bible to church with you. Uh, I've done something a little different this week, and I'm probably going to start doing this a little more often, and that is uh, I'm leaving some of the verses off the screen. Because I want you to look in your Bible. I want you to see it. I'm, I'm concerned that, so, that sometimes uh, we get the verses on the screen, but we're not actually looking in the Word. And, I th- and let me tell you how the church has gotten itself in trouble in past days. In the past days, the church would say, uh, and I'm talking about you know several hundred years ago, uh, they would say, you don't need your Bible. Come, we'll tell you what it says. And that's a, that's a dangerous place to be in. And I want you to know what the Word says. It's very important to us. And so our series of messages is called Team Unashamed. And so I've been asking several questions every week about you yourself. I'm, I'm trying to challenge us to be what God has called us to be. It comes from Romans 1.16. And uh, we've been saying we're going to memorize this verse, all right? And so here's how uh, Romans 1.16 says, for I, am unash- for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God uh, unto salvation for everyone who believes First to the Jew, but also to the Greek. Remember that verse? Okay, I want you to say it with me. All right, let's say it together. Ready? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. First for the Jew, but also for the Greek. All right? So that's our verse, and that's what we're talking about is being unashamed of being a witness for Jesus Christ. And so let me just ask you guys a question. This past week, how many of you had an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus Christ this past week, to share your faith with someone this week. Would you raise your hand this morning? Good job, guys. I'm proud of you guys. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your faith. Now, we all need to be a member of that team because God has called every believer to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let me just, uh, let me, let me just uh, say to you so that you get this, if, if you're here today and you're thinking, boy, I would like to win someone to Christ. I would like to tell someone about Christ. We've, we've got the perfect plan in place for you. Coming this Thursday night for the next four Thursday nights, uh, we have what we're calling Team Unashamed meetings for four weeks. And uh, you will not want to miss it. And someone says, well, how do I know if I should attend? Okay, if you have fear of sharing your faith, you should attend. Let me just say, so you understand this, God doesn't give a spirit of fear. And so you need to get that fear off of you, all right? And so you need to attend. So if, if you're tr- you would love to share, but you don't know what to do, you don't know how to say it, come this Thursday night. It is go- it'll bless your life. It will absolutely bless your life. So come this Thursday night. Uh, and here's the other group who should come. If you think to yourself, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I enjoy sharing my faith. You should also come to this. We think we can help you, uh, make you better. Plus, we can use you to help others to learn how to share their faith with people, all right? So I want you to come this Thursday night. It's going to be awesome. And uh, if you'll go online, it'll help us know how many are going to be here. Go online at youbelongatlife.org forward slash events. Look for Team Unashamed and register so that we know how many people will be here that night, okay? And so that'll help us out. Uh, Let's go ahead and jump into God's Word today. Now, uh, over the last few weeks, we have talked about a brother, the importance of sharing with a family member about Jesus. We have talked about a friend that God calls us to share with friends about Jesus. Uh, we talked about an enemy that God, uh, that there, that, that, you know, it's, God doesn't want you just to share with those who love you. He also wants you to share with those who hate you. And those are the, sometimes the hardest ones. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that this, uh, on, on Thursday nights as well, about how do you share with someone who hates God and doesn't believe that God exists? How do you do that? And so you'll want to be here for that. And then this week we're talking about, this is week four, we're talking about a foreigner talking about a foreigner. And so we've a friend, a brother, an enemy, and this week we're talking about a foreigner. Take your Bible. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Uh, and I want you to see this amazing passage of Scripture. Look down with me to verse number 6. And it says this, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And, and he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Let me just speak to this real quick. So this is about 40 days uh, after the resurrection uh, and another 10 days before Pentecost occurs. 
And so Jesus, this is, you're, you're almost 40 days. Jesus ascends into heaven on the 40th day. He leaves them for 10 days by themselves alone. And he tells them in this next passage to wait for the power that would be endued upon them by the Holy Spirit. And so they were going to be 10 days without the Lord. And remember, the number 10 in the Bible is always the number of testing. And so they were, being, they were under a test. He said, wait, and they were having to wait for him. Now, uh, so when you get this, it's interesting. They said, uh, they're talking to him. They said, now, Lord, is, is this the time? Is this the time? And let me, let me really help you understand what they're saying is, is this the end of time? <laughs> uh, have we come to the end of days? Or is this the last days? Are we living in the last days? Lord, would you speak to us about last days? Will you speak to us about end times? And I think sometimes that, you know, even Christians today, we get wrapped up in end times uh, theology. And I, I'm going to say there's nothing wrong with end times theology, but when it begins to impede you from being the unashamed proclaimer of the gospel, in other words, you get so wrapped up in what's could, what could happen, what might happen, and not wrapped up in all the people who need to know Jesus, you're missing it. And so Jesus just turns to him and says, hey, uh, you know, it's really not for you to understand the epics and the times. That's really not for you. Trust me, it'll work out in the end. And so I have a lot of times people will ask me, you know, what, what is your theology on eschatology? You know, eschatology is a fancy way of saying, what do you believe about the return of Christ, all right? And so uh, and let me t tell you what my position is, all right? Because there's a lot of people that say, well, are you pre-trib, are you mid-trib, are you post-trib? Are you pre-millennial? I mean, where, where do you stand, all right? So I'm going to tell you what my position is. It'll be real clear to you when you hear this, all right? I'm, I'm a pan-millennialist. That means I believe it'll all pan out in the end, Okay. And I do have a position on this, but be very careful about the position that you take. A few weeks ago, I had someone come up to me, and they said, Pastor, I've got this thing figured out. And they told me what their position was. And I said, oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've got it figured out. And I'm telling you, I'm 100% sure about this. You're 100% sure. I'm 100% sure about this. And so I said, oh, I said, well, so I listened to them. I said, tell me why it is you believe that. So they went through it. And not to be mean or anything, but... Uh, you know, as they were going through telling me their stuff, I waited, and at the very end, they said, what do you think? And I said, well, uh, how about this verse? How about this verse? How about this verse? And I blew holes all in their theory. And now, listen, uh, by the way, I, my position would probably be closer to theirs than the other, but I'm just going to say to you, as soon as you think you've got it figured out, you don't have anything figured out. I'm telling you. Uh, it is easier to understand end times after it happens. Because I'm telling you, uh, the Jewish people had amazing prophecies about Jesus, but they didn't understand it till after he came. And so we will understand better after he comes. Right now, the Bible says we only, we only see but darkly through a glass. But when we see face to face, then we will know fully, even as we're already fully known. So right now, we don't have a full understanding of end times. So don't get so wrapped up on end times. Get wrapped up. See, here's what the Bible says. Don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will take care of itself. But what, what do we need to worry about? Well, today, right now, there are people dying and going to hell. And we need to be concerned about their lives. And so Jesus says, don't worry about those things. But, but, don't worry about the end. Verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you should be my witness both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And I, I'm just going to say to you, I, I believe it's very, very important that we, that we get under the power of, of the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced of that. Uh, and, but I hear a lot of people, and I'm, I, I am a, I am a Spirit-filled believer. I, I believe in being Spirit-filled. But I want you to hear this real clear so that you understand this. Uh, the evidence of being Spirit-filled, and there's, a, there's, there's entire denominational movements who teach this and believe this, that the evidence of the, of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is tongues, speaking in new tongues. They believe that that's what it is. Okay, do you know there's not one verse that says the evidence of the Holy Spirit is the, in, is the uh, speaking in new tongues? And by the way, I believe in speaking in tongues. That's not an issue for me. But I want you to hear me very clearly. That is not the evidence of having the Holy Spirit. Okay? Someone says, well, what is? Real simple. It says it right here. When, he says, but when you receive power, he says, you said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and... Here's the evidence. You will be my witness. It, it, see, the evidence is not speaking in tongues. The evidence is when you become a witness for Jesus Christ. That's the evidence. You want to know if you're a spirit-filled believer? You can speak in tongues all day long, but if you're not a witness, you're not spirit-filled. Do you get me? Do you understand? Again, I'm not putting tongues down because I believe in tongues, but I believe in a biblical application of tongues. And I want you to understand that here's the evidence of a spirit-filled believer. It is someone who's a witness for Jesus Christ. Well, I, if I were to ask the question, how many of you want to be spirit-filled? Probably before I made that statement, most of us. 
But when I say you got to be a witness, the evidence is going to be a witness, I wonder how many people would say, well, I still want to be a spirit-filled believer. Because I'm telling you, that's what God has called us to, is to be a witness for Him. Now, it's interesting. He says, here's my pattern. He says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, and then you're going to go to Judea and Samaria, and, to the, and then, he says, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And there's an interesting word here. He says, even to the remotest parts of the earth. I want you to think with me for just a moment. That's one of the most powerful statements that we have in the scripture. He says, even to the darkest corners of the world. He goes, I want you to take my good news everywhere. Can we say, if we say that even the remotest parts of the earth, that he would say foreigners are included in his plan? Can we, can we agree with that? Okay. And by the way, uh, sometimes we don't even have to go to uh, the darkest corners of the earth to meet foreigners. In fact, we have foreigners who live here even on American soil. And so I want you to understand this. You've got to understand uh, that God is calling us to win people to Jesus. God doesn't look at people and go, ah, well, there's a black man. Uh, ah, well, there's a white man. Well, I have more favor on one or the other. God doesn't look at it that way. God looks and sees a man, and he says, I have come for everyone. Let me, let me put this a different way. He says, uh, even to the remotest parts of the earth, uh, even to the smallest people group on the earth, uh, let me put it one other way, even to you, hear me, to you, okay, you need to hear this, you were the remotest parts of the earth. If you're not Jewish, <laughs> you are the remotest parts of the earth. How many of you are glad that God had his gospel come to us? Uh, how many of you are glad that God included you in on his plan? That's why that verse says, uh, uh, he says, first to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. I love that verse. Jewish version says it like this. He says, to, for, to the Jew first, but equally, equally, equally uh, to the Gentile. Equally. Are, are you hearing me? Listen, I am glad that it's equal for all of us because that includes the rest of us. Thank you, Lord. And so this is what it means. God wants to take the remotest part of the earth. And here's the question. How is he going to do that? Uh, you think with me. They lived in a day and time where they didn't have planes and trains and automobiles, right? You didn't have those things. So how in the world was he going to accomplish this? Uh, and because think about it. Usually if you grew up in a town, you lived there the rest of your life. Okay, how in the world will God get these people to go to the remotest parts of the earth? Well, let me just show you what happened. Last week, you may remember, we talked about an enemy, and that enemy was Saul. And we see in Acts chapter 9 how Saul, was, was, uh, well, how, well, how Saul found the Lord, how Saul was saved. But before Saul was saved, I want you to notice what happens. Look with me over to Acts chapter 8 and look at verse 1. Acts 8 verse 1. Watch what happens. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And that's really talking about Stephen, that he was in total agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered. Where were they scattered? Throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In other words, the, apostle, uh, the apostles remained in Jerusalem, but the church got scattered to Judea and Samaria. Okay, watch verse 3. Uh, uh, verse 2 says, some devout men buried Stephen, made loud lamentation over him. Verse 3, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered uh, went about hiding in their houses with their heads under their pillows, crying out for mommy. <laughs> Is that there? Okay, here's what you got to get. I want you to think with me, the reason they were scattered was because God wanted to move the gospel from Jerusalem to the remotest parts of the earth. How many of you know that God will use your circumstances to further his kingdom? By the way, it doesn't mean that your circumstances are always going to be good. Uh, I, I am so tired of hearing churches that preach uh, that when you, when you become a believer, you won't have any problems. Okay, I, I, I'm being real truthful with you. Uh, God never promised that we would not have trouble. In fact, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Do you get that? We will have trouble in this world. Okay, someone says, oh, that's not good. Yeah, well, Romans 8 says, he tells us that all things work together for good. Doesn't mean all things are good, but he works everything for his own purpose. Listen, let me tell you something. Saul was being used of the Lord before Saul became a believer. Are you hearing me? Let me tell you, you don't even have to be a believer for God to use you. 
it's better to be a believer and let God use you than it is to be an unbeliever and, not, and, and still have God use you. Right? But I'm telling you, some of you are sitting there thinking, why is God putting me through the situation I'm in? Let me tell you, I believe that it's bringing glory to him in the end. I'm telling you that. Some of you are going through some hard times. Some of you have lost family members. Talked to a gentleman last night who lost his wife uh, just recently. Uh, and some of you are going through difficult times. Let me tell you something. Uh, this gentleman came up to me last night. He goes, you know, he goes, I lost my wife a couple of weeks ago. And I said, yes, sir, I know. He said, he goes, you know, but I feel like the Lord told me the other day he's not finished with me yet. Let me, can I tell you, that's hard. That's difficult. But let me tell you, God is not finished with you yet. As long as there's breath in your lungs, God wants to use you. Amen? And so he says, he goes on to say, uh, he said they went about preaching the word. And then verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And so if we're going to get this on a map real quick. So Jerusalem, if we call my hand where Jerusalem is at, he went down to, Jeru to Samaria. So Samaria is actually north of that. If we were to leave here and go to Canton, we would say we're going to go up to Canton, right? Because you usually if you're going to say down, you go down south, but you go up north, right? Okay, so why in the world would the Bible say they're going to go up, or they're going to go down to Samaria that is up? Well, it's real simple, because everything from Jerusalem is downhill. Uh, if you go to Jericho, uh, you would actually, uh, if you had to walk it in the days of Jesus, it would be one day's journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem, but to go from Jerusalem to Jericho only took a half a day. Because everything is downhill, all right? Samaria is downhill. Tel Aviv is downhill. Even Bethlehem, that's only 10 miles from, from downtown Jerusalem, is downhill. So if you go anywhere you go from Jerusalem is downhill. Does that make sense? And so he said, it's, it's amazing how Scripture is right. So they went down to Samaria, the Bible says, and they were preaching the gospel. They were proclaiming Christ to them. Now look down to verse 25, and I want you to notice how he is scattering them but in the midst of scattering them, he has a purpose and a plan. So look at verse 25, and this will not be on the screen for you, okay? So you've got to look at your word so you can see it. If you don't have a Bible, look, in, look on with someone. Ask to use theirs, all right? So Acts 8, verse 25 says, So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. I want you to just draw your attention real quick to the word solemnly testified. That's an important word. We're going to look at it. Verse 26 says, but an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate this generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. I like that word, snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Astos. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Well, when I was reading this and planning for this message, I was, it just recalled some memories to my mind. Uh, if you've, I've been in church most all of my life, and so I've, I, you know, I remember growing up hearing all these amazing stories. And of all the stories in the Bible, this had to be one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And the reason why is there's a miracle that takes place. Does anyone see it? I mean, here is Philip, 
He's baptizing the, the Ethiopian eunuch, and when the Ethiopian eunuch comes up out of the water, God snatches Philip away. Think about that. And then suddenly he reappears at Aztos and continues to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as a kid, I remember thinking about this. I would look at this, and my, my thought, I always had this, you know, you always have to picture something. So in, as a kid, I remember picturing, this is just like Star Trek. I mean, that's what I always thought, you know, teleportation, man. I mean, boom, he, he's out of there, and then boom, he reappears in another place. And I thought, man, I love that. And, I, you know, I, and, you know it, different people like different things, and I love to travel. But if I'm going to go someplace, I want to get there fast. I've always been like that, right? Uh, I, I, my wife would rather take a car uh, when we travel. I'd rather take a plane. You know, because I, I, I want to get there fast. Even when I drive, I like to get there fast, all right? So it's just the way it is. But wouldn't this be like the fastest way you could travel from one place to another, you know? And so I used to think about this. What, what an amazing miracle of God that we see in this passage of Scripture. And so, uh, but when I began to look at this, I thought, you know, there's some other things that happens in this too that, even, it, that may even be greater than the miracle of being snatched away. And so I want to show you that today. So if you'll think back, verse number uh, 25 says they solemnly testified. You remember that? It says they solemnly testified. So as I was thinking about the word solemnly testified, uh, I was thinking, you know, think, sometimes when we think of the word solemn, uh, we think, you know, saddened. They were sorrowful. That's what we think. We think they were full of sadness and they testified. They solemnly testified. Uh, but that's actually not what this word is. Now, it's interesting. Only the New American Standard Version adds, makes one Greek word two words. Solemnly testified is actually one word in the Greek. But all other versions only use the word testified. But if you, if you go and look at the Greek word, one word does not correctly define this word. And so that's why I think the New American Standard did their very best to try and attempt to add another word to bring some clarity to it. And let me tell you what, the, what it really means. Uh, it actually comes from the word, what we would call cardi, cardia, is the first part of that word, dia. Uh, and what we're talking about, it's talking about, a word, it's talking about the heart. So when he says they solemnly testified, it's talking about from their heart, they gave a testimony. Do you realize, it's amazing when we begin to look at this, I begin to think about the heart and the importance of having the heart in tune with God. And so I want to just show you these things about having a heart that's in tune with the Lord. First one is the transformation of the Holy Spirit. See, there, when, we're, when our heart is in tune with God, we are transformed by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that you're being transformed even right now? And so I want you to get that. And so I want you to hear this. It, it, there's three transforming things about a person who wants to be a witness for Christ. Let me give them to you. They all occur right here in verse 25. First thing is, if we want to tell people about Jesus, we need to, from the heart, have a testimony of what we used to be. I mean, that's what a witness really is all about. How many of you know you are no longer what you used to be? That's called being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that. And so I want you to see this. So, uh, so they, he said, I want you to, so he said they went and they solemnly, they from their heart testified. The second part is they spoke the word of the Lord. Let, let me just say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. You hear that? I want you to get this, okay? Because here's what you need to know. Uh, it wasn't my testimony that set me free. It was the holy word of God. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, that's Jesus. Let me tell you, it is God's Word who absolutely sets us free. So it says, they solemnly testified from their heart, and they spoke the Word of the Lord. And then it says, they started back to Jerusalem and were, and were preaching the gospel. Now, just so you understand this, I used to think that the gospel, when the Bible says they were preaching the gospel, that I thought, well, they were preaching the Word. Well, let me tell you, this is vastly different from proclaiming the word. When it says they were preaching the gospel, what it's talking about is proclaiming good news. Okay, watch this. Uh, when I solemnly testify from my heart, I'm saying, this is the way I used to be, but the word has changed me, and now I'm no longer what I used to be. That's good news. The word gospel means good news. That's what it means. And so what God calls every witness to be is someone who tells what God has done in their life, Tells how the Word has absolutely changed them, how Jesus has changed their life, and tells them, and you can have it too. That's good news. Isn't that, isn't that good? And so I want you to know, that's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, is when we take those three ingredients to other people. Uh, then there's a second thing that I notice that's here that's all about the heart. And that is, 
God wants a heart that's in tune with the tone of the Holy Spirit. And when I talk about a tone, I'm talking about His voice. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 10 that the sheep of His pasture hear His voice. Okay, I want you to, the reason I use the word tone, do you realize that we all speak with different tones? Uh, if my dad, who passed away uh, back in 2005, if, if my dad were to walk in this room right now, but uh, first of all, if he did, I'd probably, you know, be the first one out the door. But anyway, but if my dad did walk in the room and he were to speak, even with my eyes closed, even though it's been 10 years since I've heard his voice, I would know that's my dad's voice. You, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I know this is going to come as a shock to some of you young people who are here, uh, but uh, we, we, we haven't always had caller ID. I know that comes as a shock to some of you. But before we had, uh, how many of you remember when we had phones that didn't have caller ID? And it was always like opening a surprise gift every time you answer the phone. You didn't know who. And there were times you would think, oh, well, I hope it's not so-and-so. Woo! <laughs> and you would still answer it because you want to know what the surprise on the other end. And by the way, I, we didn't have caller ID to tell us who it was. But as soon as they said hello or spoke, you would go, well, I know who that is. How did we know? By the tone. Let me tell you, this is what believers need today. We need to be able to know the voice of God by His tone. We ought to recognize His voice immediately. Someone says, well, how do I do that? Well, you need to spend time with God. You need to spend time in His Word. You need to spend time with Him in prayer. The more that we do this, the more we hear His voice. Now, let me tell you how important the tone of the Lord is. Uh, look at uh, Acts 8, verse 26 says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. Okay, I want you to get this. It's really interesting when we read this. Uh, how did Philip know that he should, he should obey this voice that he heard? In fact, think about it like this. He was from Jerusalem. He went down to Samaria. He is coming back up to Jerusalem. And as he is, the Lord speaks to him and says, uh, Get up and go uh, south to Gaza to a desert place, to a remote place, to a deserted place. Go to a place where there is no one there. Can we say that's even to the remotest parts? And do you, do you, I want you to hear this. What if Philip had said, now, Lord, you know there's nothing out there. Now, Lord, you know I can do better work here. There's, there's 100,000 people who live inside of Jerusalem right now. Lord, I, you know you can use me better right here. Why should I go down to a desert place where there is no one? Do you understand? That's why it's so important we know the tone of the voice of God. You, let me tell you, someone says, how do, you, how do you get to the place where you hear the tone? Okay, let me, let me answer it so you understand. We know the tone because we get so filled with His Spirit. Uh, and by the way, just so you understand something, I hear, and I, this, to me, in my opinion, is a misconception of the church today. We hear people all the time say, pray that you'll get the anointing of the Lord. Okay, I want you to pray that you'll get the anointing, but once you get the anointing, you don't need the anointing again. The anointing is a one-time process. In fact, kings were only anointed once. Jesus was only anointed once. Let me, let me, so you understand this, we don't need multiple anointings. We only need one anointing, but we need to be filled all the time. We need, our fill, we need to be filled continuously. In other words, the filler needs to be renewed. And so we need to say, Holy Spirit, we need to be filled by you. This is something you can practice in your life every day. You, the first words off your lips every morning ought to be, Holy Spirit, will you fill me with your presence today? And then we need to listen for his voice. And by the way, oftentimes in the mornings when I speak to the Holy Spirit uh, and I say, Lord, I want you to fill me today. I need your presence today. That's when the Holy Spirit will say, boy, now you know there's some things right here that you've got between me and you. And I need to speak to you about this. And we need to deal with these areas of your life. And if I want to continue on in the filling of the Lord, I've got to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, whatever you want, Lord. Okay, let me, let me, so I want you to notice this. Notice what Philip did. Philip didn't go, well, Lord, let me pray about this for a few days, and then we'll see about going down there. No, the very next verse says, uh, so he got up and he went. Okay, you, this tells me about his timing. Okay, you want to know, we talk about his tone. Do you know what his timing is? You know what the timing of the Lord is? Okay, when he speaks is his timing. I hear believers all the time make this mistake. You know, the Lord, they'll come and they'll say, well, pa Pastor, I feel like the Lord spoke to me, but I'm just trying to figure out his timing. Okay, listen, if he's speaking to you about something, that's his timing. 
Are, are, are you following that? He's not sitting there going, well, you know, pray about this for 21 days. Pray about this for 40 days. Pray about listening to the Lord. Pray about being obedient to God. That's what we do when we say, I'm going to pray about this. See, when God speaks, right then, that's his voice, and that's his call to say, go now. Don't wait. Many of us are not in on the presence of God and the Spirit of God and the voice of God simply because we won't get in on the timing of God. We wait around and think, well, you know, if there's an opportune time. God says, I want you to go speak to your neighbor. Well, Lord, if you give me an opportune time. Isn't it interesting? We, we often wait for people to come to us rather than going to them. We've really changed this thing. We've gotten backwards in our faith about Christ. See, when God begins to speak to you about a person, right then is his time. Are we, are we good with that? Watch, watch, watch. This is the timing of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 27. So it says, he, so he got up and he went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasures, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Okay, isn't it interesting? What if he had waited a day? Don't you know he would have missed it? And then when he gets there, he sees this chariot, and he recognizes this is an Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, this was a black man. Uh, this is a man who was an important man. Uh, he wasn't riding Air Force One, but he was certainly riding Air Force Two. Are, y'all, are you following me? He had his secret service agents gathered around him because they wouldn't have gathered. He wouldn't have just traveled by himself. He was the treasurer of the courts of Candace. Candace is just simply another way of saying the queen mother of Ethiopia. That's who he was. He was an important character. Uh, And so uh, what if Philip had said, now, Lord, you know, he's he's too important. Uh, Now, now God, you know, you need to send someone else to him besides myself. I'm just just a lowly disciple. I I really, you know, Lord, you know, I... Maybe, maybe it's the next, the next chariot that comes by. That's the one I'm going to wait for. You know, Lord, find, find me someone who's just a beggar walking beside the road. No, God says, go up to the chariot. What if he hadn't listened? See, that was his timing right then. Go right now. And then I want you to notice that was the timing of the Lord. But notice down in uh, verse 30, it tells us about the text that he was reading, which again reveals to us, uh, reveals to us the timing of God. So the text of the Holy Spirit, verse 30 says, Philip ran up and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, I really like that. Uh, this is actually a play on words that you don't see in the English. Uh, let me help you. The word understanding there is the word gnosko. He says, do you gnosko what you are reading? The word reading is the word ana gnosko. And so here, here's what he says. He says, do you gnosko what you are ana gnosko? Uh, and, and so when the, when the Bible was being read, it was meant to relive the text. And so when we talk about Anna, it means again, do it again. So here's what he says. Do you understand what you are again understanding? That's what he's actually saying. In other words, are you reliving the text? Are you following that? Are you reliving what it's saying? And the man says, how can I? Very next verse. Unless someone t- shows me, guides me. Someone can tell me what the characters are that are in the story. And so I want you to see this because it's really un- unbelievable. He says, he said to him, how, well, how can I let someone guide me? He invites Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Let me help you with this. This is actually Isaiah 53. This is the text that Jewish people would skip over. Someone says, why would they skip over this? They would read Isaiah 51, Isaiah 52. When they get to Isaiah 53, Jewish people will skip over this passage because they don't know how to explain a suffering Savior. In fact, Isaiah 53 tells us specifically who the Messiah would be. And when you read it, there is no doubt in your mind that it's, that it's Jesus. And he says, so he, I want you to notice this, drop on down a little further. Uh, verse 34 says, the eunuch answers Philip and says, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? So then Philip, in the timing of the Lord, opened his mouth. And beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Okay, isn't it interesting? What if Philip had stayed in Jerusalem and said, let me pray about this? What if he had said, I'm not going to go up and see this guy? And now I want you to see the perfect timing of the Lord. At that very moment when he approached the chariot, he was reading Isaiah 53 out loud. Do you think 
that that was just a coincidence. Okay, listen, I want you to hear me. Uh, No one is a coincidence to God. You're all important to him. Every one of you. Uh, See, we were the remotest parts of the earth. How many of you are glad that you found the Lord? How many of you are glad that someone came and guided you so that you would know the Lord? This man said, how can I know unless someone guides me? Listen to me. So you get this. We're all guides. Every one of us. And there are people that only you can reach. Only you. And so, but God wants to use his word to do that. Here's the last thing I want you to see, and that is the transfiguration of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice how this man's life gets transfigured. Remember, we already talked about this one miracle where he gets snatched away, but I want you to really see a bigger miracle than Philip being snatched away. Uh, Acts 8, verse 36 says, as they went along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip answers and says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, this is so important to the text. I want you to understand this. Uh, baptism does not save you. He wasn't saying, hey, let me be baptized so I can be saved. What he was saying is, uh, I want to get in on this amazing truth that you're telling me about. I want to get in on this Jesus. And if you say that I need to be baptized, I want to be baptized. He says, what, do I, what keeps me from being baptized? Only one thing. you got to first believe. See, that was salvation for him. And you know what he said? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. By the way, m- let me help you a little bit. There's a, we oftentimes will do what we call the sinner's prayer. If you've been around church very long, you know what I'm talking about. In other words, we pray and say, we say what we call the sinner's prayer, and we invite Jesus to come into our hearts and our lives. Do you know there's not one verse of Scripture that says you have to say a sinner's prayer in order to be saved? Not one. Not one. It's important. You know, now, I, I like the sinner's prayer. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a great way for us to be able to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. But just so you know, it's not about a sinner's prayer. Let me tell you what it's about. It's about believing that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what it's about. That's what brings salvation. And, and this guy says, I believe. You know what Philip said? Philip said, stop the chariot. Come on, let's go get baptized. And he takes him right down to the water, and he gets baptized right there on the spot. When he comes up out of the water, Philip disappears But here's what I think is the greatest miracle of all. Here's what you really need to see the greatest miracle of all. He comes up out of the water. He doesn't sit there and go, where did Philip go? Dude, where did Philip go? Well, how am I going to make it now? How am I going to be able to proceed forth in life? You never see this. You know what the Bible says? Watch what happens. The Bible says he orders the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch no longer saw him, here's, here's key, but went on his way rejoicing. Went on his way rejoicing. Let me just tell you, there was a transfiguration that day, but it wasn't Philip that got transfigured. It was this Ethiopian eunuch that got transfigured. And the bigger miracle was not, was not Philip. The greater miracle was that Jesus can save anyone. Anyone. So I, and here, I want you to understand, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, Jesus can transfigure your life. And by the way, if you get transfigured, you'll eventually get transformed. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By, and by the way, you say, how do you know it's transfigured? Because the Bible says old things pass away and all things become new. Wouldn't you call that a transfiguration? God wants to do this for your life. Now, here's the interesting thing. We're not told anywhere in Scripture uh, about this Ethiopian eunuch and what happened to him. In fact, there are very, very few uh, records, uh, historical records, that tell us anything else about this guy. Very few. There's one or two, but they're they're even sketchy because they were written several hundred years after this event. So we don't even know if they're true or not. So someone says, well, whatever happened to this guy? I don't know. I don't know. But when I was studying, I found a verse of scripture in Psalms, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if that is prophetic of this Ethiopian eunuch. I I wonder if this is really speaking about the the, the people of Ethiopia and how the gospel began to spread to Africa. Uh, let, let me read it for you. Psalm 68, verse 31 says, Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia, watch this, will quickly stretch out her hands to God. They will quickly stretch out their hands to God. I want you to think about this. Uh, do you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ has literally penetrated nearly every corner of Africa? It's unbelievable. 
uh, Pastor Nathan several months ago uh, showed me, uh, was telling me about a church in Africa that they are now building a building. They have literally hundreds of thousands of people who come every weekend to worship. Hundreds of thousands. It is now the largest church uh, in the world uh, in Africa. They are building a building to house these people when they come to church. Uh, and the building, he was, he was showing it to me, the building, when they're complete in construction for it, the building will be almost two miles in length. Okay, here's what I want you to know. The gospel has penetrated Africa. I wonder if perhaps some of that is because of this Ethiopian eunuch who went back to his homeland and told them because he, was in, he rejoiced. He went back and said, let me tell you what God is doing. Let me tell you what God is doing. By the way, that verse says uh, Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. Verse 32 says, they will sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, and they will sing praise to the Lord. Selah. The word Selah means, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? Okay, listen to me. I'm telling you, here's what we really got to get in this story. He was, a, he was an Ethiopian. He was a eunuch. Uh, the Bible tells us very clearly that, uh, that, that foreigners could not enter the Temple Mount. He had gone up to worship at Jerusalem, but he couldn't go in. The Temple Mount represented the presence of the Lord, but he couldn't go in. Also, the Bible tells us that eunuchs, if you were a eunuch, you could not go into the presence of the Lord. Okay, here's what you got to get. The Lord saw him come to worship. And on his way home, the Lord sent Philip to a desert place. And here's what, here's what I think God told him. I think the Lord told Philip, he couldn't enter my presence at the temple, but you bring my presence to him. Can I tell you something? This is what every believer is called to do, is to bring the presence of the Lord to those who've never entered the presence of the Lord. This is our job. This is what God has called us to do. And I want you to do it as well. Can I pray for you? Father, I love you. You're amazing. You're holy. You're great. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is right and that it is real. And I pray you'll penetrate hearts and lives in this place today. Lord, speak to us how you want to right now. Speak to us how you want to right now. I ask a question nearly every week. When we finish the message, this is what we call the invitation time. It's an invitation for you to hear God. And so just remain in an attitude of prayer for a moment. And just ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me through this, whole, through this message? As, as I was, I, I pray this same prayer in my preparation. I pray the same prayer. Lord, what are you saying to me through this message? Because I want to be spoken to as well. And w as soon as I prayed that prayer this week, immediately God put a person's face in my mind just immediately someone that would be considered uh, a foreigner just put it put them in my mind and as soon as he did I thought okay and this is what I feel like the Lord said to me I feel like the Lord said Mark you're the only one that I have called to be the influence in this person's life. And I want you to influence them. And I plan to. I'm telling you, I am so excited because I'm praying that this person will come to know the Lord as their Savior. Uh, I wonder if God, as we were praying, put someone's face, someone's name, on your heart this morning. Last night, I told the people, I said, here's what we want to do. We want to pray for you. We want to put courage into you. Don't you think the word courage, the first word, C-O-R, comes from the Latin. It literally means heart. We want to put heart in you. We want to put courage in you. There's another way to say it. We want to encourage you through prayer and we want to pray for you someone says will you pray for this my friend well we'll pray for your friend but more than that we want to pray for you that you'll have the boldness and the courage to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ in their life so in just a moment our prayer team is going to get up and they're going to come here to the front and if God puts someone's name someone's face on your heart 
Would you be faithful to come and let us pray for you that the courage of the Lord might be put in? And by the way, last night, second service, when I got finished, I got down, I sat down in the front row, and the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to go, and I want you to let someone pray over you. So I came forward last night because I wanted courage put into me so that I can go and share my faith with this person. So don't think you're too big for it. Don't get so prideful and arrogant that you think I, prayer is not for me. Prayer is for you. In fact, the reality is we all need prayer. We all need prayer. And let me say, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in just a moment, I'm going to pray one more time. And as soon as I finish that, our prayer team is going to stand and come to the front. And if you need Jesus, you just stand up with them and you come and just say, when you get to the front, hey, I need Jesus. And we will introduce you to our Savior. He will change your life convinced of it. If he's changed mine, he'll do it for you too. Do you need prayer today? Doesn't matter for what. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come. Lord, you're amazing. You're holy. I pray for every person in this room this morning. God, that we'll be faithful and obedient to you. And Lord, I am excited today because I believe your Holy Spirit is going to put courage in to us to be the witnesses that you have called us to be. What I'm really asking for, Lord, is a Holy Spirit filling in this place. Fill us, Lord, to the top and to overflowing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer, come.